Good morning, Austin. I'm so excited to be here shouting at you. I'll try not to shout too much. Sorry. Hello, hi, I'm Erica Hall from Mule Design in San Francisco. Um, and while we don't design you know, bots or messaging systems specifically, what we do is tell our clients what to do, how to do it, and what things are good and bad ideas. And I'm actually super excited about the explosion of bots and messaging apps uh, because I like the fact that all of this is coming from a place of let's, uh, let's take what people are already doing and already excited to do and make it more fun and more useful instead of, you know, oh, we're going to build some features and try to get people to change their habits and, uh, you know, do something boring and hope that human adaptability sorts it out. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a very sad story. And uh, this is a sad story that really got me to understand the importance of language as an interface and why people just fight it so hard. A few years ago, we were working with uh, a really large uh, multinational business publishing organization. And they had developed this amazing semantic search engine. Um, you know, it could really dig through news stories and find all this meaning and everything. And uh, it had a really, really complicated interface with all these like knobs and dials. And they were so proud of it. And uh, unfortunately, everybody came to their site to use this semantic search engine and couldn't figure it out. And they had a 99.9% .9 bounce rate. And they were very sad. And they came to us and they're like, fix it. And we looked at it, and I said, well, the first thing is, why don't you just put some words up there that tell you, uh, that tell the users how to, how to work the system? And, and they said, well, we, we talked about putting some language up there to explain how it works, but that would take too long, because it would have to go through this editorial process. And I said, no, you know, just put anything up there. Put anything and we can change it tomorrow. And they're like, uh, well, we talked about that. We just can't agree on what it would say. And I'm like, this is the internet. Use words, use different words, react and change it. But they were a publishing company, and they couldn't conceive of this, and their business failed. Like, we couldn't help them. Um, and, and this really brought home to me that People like clients and designers like flee from the idea of using language in an interface. Uh, like pictures, great. Videos, great. But you start talking about, well, just like put words in there as part of the design. And they're like, no, that means we've failed somehow if we have to actually interact with people in words. And this is surprising to me because this is how humans interact, right, with each other. We're like, talk, 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 talk. OK, now we've got phones and stuff, and we're like, OK, using language. And still, when we work with people to design something, they're like, hey, can't we just do a video? Can't we do something gestural? You know, People really see the use of language as a failure. And this is really curious to me. So like, what's wrong with? design out in like the rest of the world, not people who are like seeing the, how, like jumping on interacting with people through messaging and bots and how neat and efficient this can be, is like, you know, we started once we got out of the command line to, um, you know, we thought, well, we can design graphical user interfaces and that's really neat. You know, we can use windows and icons and menus and, um, but the problem was that this was then construed as graphic design of user interfaces, even though a lot of graphic user interfaces are actually primarily language. And a lot of designers would say, well, you know, if we just design the buttons, we're done. You know, even though the label, the functionality, is actually the interface and is actually exciting and interesting to people. Um, and I was looking uh, 
to see, to make sure that I wasn't just, uh, you know, harshing on designers and saying, oh, you all kind of fear words. But I started to find when you look for instructions for people on like how to design app interfaces, they start with, you know, draw some rectangles, not with like, what do you want to say? What's your meaning? But if you want to make an interface, just sketch it out. But the, the problem is you're just, you're making some images that don't even necessarily have meaning. And people want to interact. And people want to interact verbally. And like, maybe if you're lucky, somebody bothered to put some thoughtful content into those rectangles. But design keeps getting defined as just drawing some shapes. And this is still really, really true out in the world. And the reason for this is that everybody's still, to this day, working in these weird silos. You know, design, code, content. If you're lucky, they go in this order. But a lot of times, they don't. And content never comes first. Um, and people talk about content like this undifferentiated stuff. And if you're in a large organization, like the silos are particularly uh, concrete and thick and hard to get through. Um, I was talking with a, a really large financial services organization, and I was talking with some of the interface writers, and, and this was a group that was really design-oriented and very thoughtful, but they ran into the same issue of somebody at some point would just call them up and say, hey, could you give me some words for this interface? And I said, well, can't you like stay with your product and, and find out how well the language is working and continue to write new commands and labels and prompts? And they said, no, because there's one visual designer for every product but each interface writer has to work on 10 different products. Um, and so everything sucked because they didn't consider the language part of the design. So there's this big split, this big historical split between design and content, between the visual and the verbal that we still have to this day, even though as a user, you're dealing with one experience and frequently the, the language you're interacting with is the most important part. And there's like, there's no, just, there's no interface between these two parts of the design. You're in one camp or the other camp. And then the people who do advocate for the importance of human language in your interface, they talk about it as content. And this is what I see when I hear that word. It's just this stuff. And the whole concept encourages hoarding. And it gets people to just think of it as a thing that you put into whatever nice container you've designed. Um, and it's not good. So um, Roy Bahat, one of the, uh, the investors uh, for Howdy, uh, said, uh, I, I read an interview, he was talking to Ben, and he said something I, I thought was really interesting, which is that if we believe machine intelligence will make our applications smarter, they might as well just start talking to us. And that's why conversation is the new interface. And so I definitely agree with the first part. But, um, but I, I want to add something to his assessment that, that it's this new interface, because it's actually something we've been using for a really, really long time. And to understand how we got to kind of the sorry state of interface design that we're in, that I'm hoping messaging helps get us out of, uh, we'll take a quick look at the entire history of human communication, just for a little context. Um, writing is so hard that people put it off for a really, really long time. Uh, as a species, we procrastinated as long as possible. Archaeologists estimate that 150 to 200,000 years ago, uh, people were talking, people were sitting around the campfire and chatting and conversing. And then it wasn't until 30,000 years ago that 
people even started making marks on cave walls. You know, they weren't even close to transcribing speech yet. And then about uh, 6,000 years ago, uh, some Sumerian uh, traders were tired of getting ripped off. And so they invented cuneiform, the wedge-shaped script, to, um, to sort of track their accounts. And so by a conservative estimate, uh, out of all of our time being human and using language, we've only been using written language for 4% of that time. Uh, so this means we've been conversing for a pretty long time, 2,300 years ago, alphabets, and then everything happened with our man Gutenberg 500 years ago. And, uh, and all of a sudden we had the printing press and communication uh, and knowledge was uh, no longer the province of the elite. People could print whatever they wanted. It was this huge revolution. It bolstered the middle class. And, uh, and created a lot of the culture that we're still clinging to today. Um, so what, this, what happened in the last 150,000 years is we had this oral culture and we moved to a literate culture. Like once we had the printing press, we're like, yeah, this is who we are. But this had a lot of other societal changes that went along with it. You know, things that were public now became private. Back before we could write, back when talking to each other was the only way of transmitting information, there was no such thing as private ownership of knowledge. There was no such thing as plagiarism. Uh, nobody could be an author, right? So for most of our history, everything was communal and conversational. And um, you know, before literacy, words were ephemeral. For, for your ideas to be preserved, they had to be interesting, and they had to be memorable, and you had to put them in somebody else's head and transmit them like that. You know, things like biblical proverbs were written in very concrete language because otherwise people wouldn't remember them. This is an actual biblical proverb that maybe you'll remember because it's gross. But it's so true. I mean, this is really true. Um, so in order like, for ideas to be uh, perpetuated in the world, other people had to participate in that transmission of knowledge. But then we got writing. And as soon as we got writing, we started to suck. I mean. Um, humans got a lot smarter and our technology was able to progress, but once we could stop and think about our words and write them down and rewrite them, we got long-winded and we got abstract and we started locking ourselves up in our little writing studios to write about things. And all of a sudden we had abstract thought and communication from one person to another could happen not only across space but across time. So all of a sudden you could hear from people who died long ago or communicate with people in the future long after you were dead. And so everything, everybody started thinking about their communication like they were saving it for posterity. Like all of a sudden their words were something special and precious and had to be agonized over. So uh, the, the reason I went back into all this like academic history is that when we look at the hallmarks of an oral culture as opposed to a literate culture, you'll see everything about our, that oral culture that we had for 200,000 years being immediate and active and interactive and social and event-based and context-aware. Those are all the things that we want in our software. Those are the things we enjoy online. But 
when you look at all the, the attributes of literate culture, those are things that we still cling to because they make us feel smart. You know, you talk to people who write a lot, and it still matters more that you get published in a printed book than if you publish online, and that makes no sense, except that we've been brought up that way. To think that something that's authoritative and individually authored is more valuable. So if you look at the ways that companies might talk to people, you know, when Slack talks about what they do, they say, be less busy, which is awesome. It's concrete, it's immediate, it feels like a person's talking to you. And then you look at an enterprise based organization and they're talking about market specific solutions. This is a phrase that would not have survived the campfire 100,000 years ago. Been like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how to repeat that. It doesn't have any bearing on my real life. So it's a choice between the interactive oral culture, which is alive and present and immediate, and the literate culture, which is boring and dead. And then, about nine or 10 years ago, this weird thing happened where we started getting smartphones, and all of a sudden, we became even more immediately connected to people, and messaging started taking off. Um, and, and we stopped talking to one another, even as we got more social, so we just started typing at one another which is, is really strange, because if you look at the physical act, it looks like writing, but we're not writing. We're having fun little conversations that somehow totally don't stress us out the way that writing does. Nobody sits there and agonizes over their messages, and we're, we all assume that like autocorrect is gonna fuck things up and that's gonna make it funny and that's great. Um, it doesn't say anything about our intelligence that things go wrong. It actually gives us reasons to feel closer to one another and more actively engaged. Um, and all of a sudden our media has gotten super weird. Like people are on the news reading tweets and you're like, what, what's going on? Like, it, I feel that this is an, an alive, immediate thing, but we're reading little documents to each other, and we're all kind of experiencing this at the same time, but it's all time shifted. And so the present we're living in, that our use of language and our interface design hasn't even caught up to, is super weird. And there's um, a linguist, uh, a dead guy, uh, a Jesuit priest named Walter Ong who coined the phrase secondary orality, which is that's a horrible phrase, uh, to mean that we're all now in sort of a new uh, being around the campfire situation, but we can save our conversations and we can interact with our conversations in all these exciting ways that wouldn't be possible without literacy, without being able to write things down and save them. But but is that free-flowing, back and forth, that's participatory, uh, that isn't so much about authorship or privacy or any of those things. And um, uh, my favorite example of how we communicate now, uh, Hillary Clinton trying to reach out to the youth. Uh, her campaign asked on Twitter, how do you feel about your student loan debt in three emoji or less? Um, <laughs> and she was busted for, for her campaign, whoever tweeted this out, who couldn't tell the difference between a mass noun and a count noun, um, was busted for saying three emojis or less instead of three emojis or fewer. Um, in the form of a Game of Thrones gif that made the same comment. So this, this is our communication now. And it's awesome, and it's so much more fun. But it's not about ownership. Like, Game of Thrones didn't get money for using that gif. 
It's about pulling things into a new context. It's about being able to poke fun at a presidential candidate and all of us being together in the same online space. And it's about um, public figures being able to um, do a terrible job reaching out to people of different generations. So this is a really neat, fantastic future we're all living in and creating together, but it's not what we expected, because we kind of expected that we'd be done with words by now. We thought we'd just be pointing at icons for things, and this is everybody who has this sort of fear of dealing with language, because they connect it to that sense of, I'm being graded on this paper if I use words, is, is kind of surprised that all of a sudden, all of our online experiences that are so fun and so throwaway and so playful um, and helping us actually accomplish things in our lives, they're all made out of words. And now that we're starting to really think about interacting with artificial intelligence in our real lives, it doesn't look like this. We don't really want it to look like this, because this is creepy. And when I think about robots that look like my friends, you know, I think about how do I interact with my friends? You know, I interact with my friend Dave on Slack all the time. I haven't seen Dave in person in like six months but I still feel like we're good friends and we talk all the time, and I still feel like I have a good sense he's alive. Um, you know, these aren't words coming to me from some distant past, but because of the future we live in, Dave is now completely indistinguishable from Howdy. They look that like, okay, that the pictures are slightly different, but Dave could just as easily have a little cartoon avatar and I'd still feel like it was Dave. So we're now in this weird world where our closest friends and scripts that run on, you know, in chat rooms and messaging apps are interchangeable from a sensory perspective. Um, and that has a lot of, a lot of fantastic possibilities. And, and sometimes it might mean we should get out more. Because if all your friends are bots, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with having some friends who are bots. But if all your friends are bots, maybe go to a bar. And so, so now we, we have all this exciting technology, you know, artificial intelligence and, um, Neurolinguistic programming is all getting more and more sophisticated, and that means we have to use language and take it really seriously in our design process. But the problem is that writers and designers who come from this traditional background think this is how you do good work, right? If you're a writer, and I actually, I've talked to people, I do workshops with people, to try to help them get over this and say, okay, you should be more collaborative, you should let it go. And they're like, no, I have to go off and I have to write my first draft all by myself before I show it to anybody else. Why? People feel like if they don't do work alone in a room by themselves, it doesn't count because that's the terrible culture we've been brought up in. People haven't been rewarded for having fun or, um, you know, writing a bunch of stuff and throwing it away and not caring and being playful. We're still getting rewarded. You know, we're still putting designers' names on things, even though the things we're designing today are so complicated and require so many systems to be integrated, it's ridiculous for one person to sign their name. But we're still dealing with this sense of like, we don't have collective ownership yet even though our experiences and what makes our experiences great are that we're all interacting and creating them together. And then, so you've got the writers fighting to go off and create words all by themselves in sadness. 
And then you've got designers, you go to a designer, and I've had this happen, so I'm not just like slamming designers who are lovely people. You go to a graphic designer and you're like, hey, could you just put in the actual text that's gonna go in that interface? And their heads go, boom. Like they start crying. They're like, no, no, that's for the content strategist. I just make the interface. But if I went to the same person and said, okay, you don't have to write it down, you just, just tell me. Just tell me what should the button say. You know, what should the interface's response be? They could totally tell me. But as soon as you say write it down, it triggers this, like, Ben Franklin is looking over my shoulder disapprovingly kind of attitude. And even professional writers, you know, They all, everybody who deals with this feels the same way. Like, writing is horrible and painful, and it should be painful if you're doing it right. And that's not true. We just need, we need to stop writing. I just want everybody to stop writing because it's not doing anything good for our use of language or our sanity. So, as I, I mentioned before, what's so exciting to me about the emerging popularity of messaging and bots is that they're poised to have an even more significant effect on interface design than mobile first and responsive design and all of that. Because it now is becoming clear that it makes no sense to design an interface form first. It makes no sense to draw pretty boxes and have somebody else put meaning into them. That's like shooting a movie first and then writing the script. And that's what we're doing with the vast majority of interfaces we're designing. And it's bad, but it's how we work, how we've been trained to work, and how we're rewarded for working. So Alan Cooper uh, said a super smart thing about the, the idea of computer literacy and what a hateful idea it is because it's just a euphemism for all of us as designers and developers doing our jobs badly, right? We want the software, and especially at this point with our technology, to, to be how people expect it to be and to think how people think, and that means conversationally, even if it's not in messaging, even if it's an app or a website, the more conversational it is, the more it reflects how people actually think and interact with each other. So this is kind of a sad truth for the graphic designers out there. The ideal interface with a system is no interface at all. Like, it'd be much better if you didn't have to deal with your online banking website if you could just say out into the air, transfer $1,000 into my savings account, and we're almost there. We are like five minutes away from just saying things or texting something and having it happen. We're almost at the point where we can think something and make it so, because the systems we're designing are, are, they're made out of concepts and they're made out of thoughts and we're still treating them like they're made out of paper and ink. So all an interface is, is a way for you to understand what the system's value is and to get that value out of it. It just has to be the easiest way for a human. You know, you just want to optimize how valuable is the system and how meaningful and easy to use is the interface. It's not a thing apart from everything else. And so this is something we need to think about when we're like, oh, you know, we should do that over messaging or we should make a bot for that. Because sometimes maybe that isn't the easiest way. Maybe sometimes even with the interfaces we're talking about here today, maybe those aren't the easiest. And even if we're talking about something that's just made out of a set of concepts strung together, even if it's a voice interface that has no physical visual manifestation, we still have to design it, which means our entire concept of interface design has to change. 
and people, and especially the people who aren't in this room, are going to be kicking and screaming because they want a portfolio piece, because they want a clipping, because they want to be able to point to one discrete document and say, I made that all by myself, sad and alone in a room. And we're all going to have to take all those people and say, no, we all need to be together in the same room because it will be better and more fun and they won't believe us. It will be like Plato's allegory of the cave. We'll be like, no, come into the sunlight. And they'll be like, no, I'm alone and sad, designing all by myself. So really quickly, uh, the thing about conversation that I want to talk about is it's really interesting. Like, we never stop to think about conversation with other humans. We never think about what a goddamn miracle it is that you can walk up to any random stranger who speaks English and interact with them in a way that's probably going to be reasonable because we've all agreed on how it works. So uh, Paul Grice was a, a philosopher and a linguist who thought a lot about language but didn't use it so good. And, uh, and he came up with this principle of cooperation to say for us to be able to converse with each other at all, we have to kind of implicitly agree on how conversation works. And all of this means, this sort of complicated compound principle, is read the room and pitch in. It just means like kind of have a sense for where things are going, where everybody wants it to go, and help it along. Like, you know, like, you've probably talked to people who, who don't cooperate conversationally, people who get really passive-aggressive, or people who um, pretend not to understand what you mean when they really do. And they're putting the brakes on conversation because they're not uh, operating according to the principle that we never think about but always act in accordance with whenever we have a functional conversation. And so the four maxims of this principle, and these will be really familiar to anybody who's designed interfaces. The same things that make a conversation go, make an interface go. Make an experience feel effortless because it feels like the system's working with you. And all this means, the quantity, quality, relation, and manner, all this means is that you provide just enough information. You're truthful. The information you provide is relevant, and it's brief, orderly, and unambiguous. The same things that make a conversational interface between two humans standing in a room work are the exact same things that make any conversational interface work. You have to give people the right information at the right time. You can't lie to them. And please, like, be brief. And don't be ambiguous. Like one of the, um, the most important principles in interface design, the thing that creates the most work is when you don't know what something means, right? When somebody wasn't clear enough, when they didn't bother to disambiguate, and you're wondering, like, what does that mean? What will happen when I click on that? Like, that's terrible. It's the same way where in real life, it's really disconcerting if somebody gives you kind of an ambiguous response. And, you know, there was a, that famous book a while back, uh, Don't Make Me Think. We need to continue to do whatever we can so that the people who are using the things we've designed don't have to do extra work and don't have to think. And I think this is one of the particular challenges of, like, messaging interfaces and bots because people don't know what to expect yet. So we really have to put a lot of effort into the cues and the way we use language. So the process, I think this talk was described like, I'm going to tell you the process for doing this well. Here's the process. Language is a social phenomenon. The tools we're designing are now social phenomena that stand in for other humans. The only way to design an interaction is by having interactions with other people. Virtually no one works this way. Nobody just sits down and says, hey, let's talk through the flow before going off and making a process diagram. Somebody will go off and make a process diagram, and then you'll come back and talk about it. And that makes no sense. 
The form, whatever you're designing, should follow the meaning. If you can't sort of prototype the process you're designing by sitting down with one of your colleagues and talking back and forth and role playing and say, I'm the system, you're the user. If you can't talk that out, you shouldn't be designing anything. You shouldn't be coding anything. You need to do this first. And this is really uncomfortable for a lot of people who've been brought up in this literate culture that prizes documentation because people define their design work in terms of, I've made a bunch of comps. I've written a bunch of pages. And sure, we have to document things so that we can understand our decisions, but we don't like make a pile of stuff on our own first and then call that an interaction design. You know, that's like animating a corpse that you threw together in your Photoshop lab and being like, cool, I made life. You know, interactions are things that exist among people in time, and that's how we need to work on them. Um, yeah, I was talking to Ben. This is the first picture that comes up on Google for Ben, by the way. Um, and we were talking about how hard it is to do a good job uh, writing these conversational interfaces, creating them. And he said, like, who has the intestinal fortitude to write, I'm sorry, I don't understand, in 12 on-brand variations, which is what you need for a bot to really sound uh, you know, snappy and human and not like it's just rote saying the same thing over and over again. And it is a tremendous amount of work if you do it by yourself. Because the answer to this question is no one. No one person should be sitting in a room writing all the dialogue for a bot or writing all the interface language. You should be going back and forth in your Slack channel, on SMS, passing three by five cards to each other across a table. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you need to interact with other people and use that as the basis for your design because doing it backwards will be terrible. So really quickly, it's important to have a personality, because if you don't have a good looking face or you don't have a face at all, you need a personality, some set of identifiable characteristics, you need some charisma. This is a video you can watch online. I don't recommend it. Um, so it's so hard to make an interface that's just reliably functional. So building in charisma is really, that's like next level stuff. But there's one important role a rule when you think about creating a personality for uh, some piece of software that's going to look like a person in a messaging system, it all has to come from the role of the system you're designing in the life of the user. Like, what's your role? If this were a person, what would it be? Would it be a bank teller? Would it be a lawyer? Would it be a friend? It probably actually wouldn't be your friend. Facebook. I know there are Facebook people here, but probably not the people responsible for this. Facebook doesn't actually care about me, and that's fine. I don't expect them to, so this creeps me out. Every time I get this message, I'm like, ew, who are you? Why are you watching me? Go away. So really quickly, so I had a conversation with my friend Josh, who's a screenwriter, and he's a really good guy, and I'm like, Josh, how do you write dialogue that's good? And he just told me, you have to like people. You can't hate people and do your job effectively selling ideas and concepts to people. You don't only have to like people, you have to like being around people, at least professionally, and then you can go out and take what you've learned. He said the thing that makes his work awesome is that he finds it's awesome to have people who are psyched about the same things you're excited about in different ways for different reasons. So you have to go out among the people. You have to study the people that you're designing for. You have to listen to them without judgment, and this is very hard. It's very hard to just go out and hear how people use language and not say, oh, that's wrong, or that's bad, or that's stupid, or that's boring. It's real. You have to be students of the real. 
and you have to expose yourself to good language. And that means don't look at stuff online. Most language online is really, really shitty. Like rent Deadwood, read poetry, go to an improv show. Language is like a highly contagious social phenomenon and you have to expose yourself to it because you're gonna catch language and you're gonna catch good language or bad language. So this is the design principle that we'll take forward with us. Designing truly interactive systems that communicate humanly and humanely is an ongoing process. We're never going to be done. Never, ever, ever. We can't just publish our software and walk away. So we need to recognize that the reason why messaging and bots are so delightful right now is because the practice is young. It's like the early days of the web or the early days of apps. You know, it's just a few people in a room together doing something because it's cool. And so you have to hang on to that because companies are going to get bigger. Companies are going to get bought. And once you get those corporate structures that depend on documentation and authority up in your messaging interfaces, they're going to make them abstract and boring and dull. So you have to defend the humanity and the potential of all of this. So stay connected, stay personable, and just please keep talking to each other. Thank you. Yeah. Whoa.